I sort of, I guess it sort of takes us into like the funding problem and the license problem, as you were saying there. So the way that most, there's sort of two ways that most, uh, both free software and open source projects are funded. One is a donation model where users who like the application, they donate if they feel like donating. The second is support services. So a lot like Red Hat, Red Hat's entire model is offering support. That's pretty much the entire way. Like there's not really a sale of software that exists in this space. There is very minor cases, um, but that's that. Those are the exception. Yes, I would say that that is true. Mm -hmm. So, what do you feel like Futo can do to address this problem that is different from what's already happening now? And do you well, have an issue with like the current way that funding? How does it... is there an issue with the way that funding is currently done, or do you feel like there is a way that? It can. It's already a good model, but it can be expanded upon to be more viable. Well, I, I think this is one of the experiments that we're attempting to try here with, mm -hmm. um, just like, uh, like first off, we're we're, in in a certain sense, we're attempting to rejuvenate this like old school shareware or freeware model. Mm -hmm. uh, like, it, uh, I, people here in the office, I don't know if they would like characterize it that way but that is what we're doing is we're trying to say like look in the 90s you have shareware everywhere and people were paying for it people started entire companies on these like shareware freeware models mm -hmm. and it just worked and it wasn't a donation it was you buying the software uh and then you could you know you could do this where you have access to the software and then you buy a license to it mm -hmm. like this is kind of an old school model but i think it worked and i don't know why most of these software companies have ditched this kind of model to be more proprietary or to be more locked down or whatever like i there are all sorts of reasons why obviously but i i don't think that there's a really good reason for why people moved away from this other than that uh they want more control over their customers they want more um, you know, there, there's just monetary incentives that caused the culture to move away from this, but the, the model worked fine. And that's the kind of model that we're trying to push, I would say. Mm -hmm. Well, when people hear that, they, they do hear, like, freeware obviously has like a, freeware and shareware obviously have like a lot of baggage attached to them. When people hear that, they obviously still think of the software being monetarily free, but they don't associate that with an open source like model that Futo is trying to do. So how does that sort of interact with what Futo is trying to do here? I mean, I I don't necessarily see it as some kind of, I, I guess I'm not sure I understand the question. I, I guess in a certain sense they interact because, you know, people like our software and they pay for it. They buy a license sure. and it's free if you don't buy a license like you can freeload you can have the infinite trial period so to speak as long as you want um you don't have to buy anything but yeah i i guess this is the thing we we want to preserve as much as we can from like these fsf style licenses in terms of individual user freedom mm -hmm. and at the same time we want to restrict developers from being exploited by corporations it's mm -hmm. it's that simple like these licenses, especially the, you know, OSI style licenses, don't stop developers from being essentially just completely exploited by these large corporations for free labor. Mm -hmm. And what, all we're trying to do is split the difference. It's mm -hmm. say like for an individual user, you basically have your freedoms preserved. Mm -hmm. And then for a large corporation, you, <laughs> you have to uh you know you gotta pay right you gotta pay up you gotta pay a lot no <laughs> i'm just kidding but uh you know basically make it as difficult as humanly possible for them to do anything with sure, our software sure. so the reason I, I i bring this up is because there is whenever the idea of funding is brought up in in this space a lot of people would like to some people misunderstand it some people do bring it up as a legitimate concern there are people out there, like there are big parts of the world where 
the idea that you can get software for free is basically the reason they are able to do computing. So there are like developing nations where people just do not have the money to pay for software. There are people who are like 12 years old. They don't have the ability to pay for software yet without stealing their parents' credit card. And because of that, there is sort of this... It's starting to change and people are becoming more open to being able to pay for software but there is a lot of like cultural pushback in the in the free software and open source spaces about paying for software which is kind of funny because in the early days of linux it was very common to have commercial distros it's just that i brought this up plenty of times before ubuntu basically killed the consumer um the consumer commercial distro because it was just everything all the others did but also better <laughs> yeah I I mean I'm old enough that as a kid uh I recall like my father buying a physical copy of like I think it it wasn't Red Hat at the time it, it was called something else but like I had a physical <laughs> cardboard box of Linux on my shelf <laughs> as a kid you know like I I remember this being the model and I see that it's mostly dead now <laughs> for Linux in particular at least but I, I guess our experience internally has been quite the opposite. Like uh, our our video client app, you know, people buy these licenses. It's not enough for it to like break even or to come anywhere near the amount of investment that we put into it. But at the same time, it's a sizable amount of people that are open and willing to pay for good quality software. And I think it's a model that in, I, I think it's a model that works. And I think that the experimental data that we're seeing so far on the few things that we've monetized, we're just getting a lot of people, like sizable amounts of people using our software that just say like, hey, I like the software, here's a license. And reasonable pricing is the other thing about this. Like mm -hmm. if we have it reasonably priced for individuals and of course like corporations, uh, you know, <laughs> if you're trying to bulk buy licenses or something as a corporate entity, mm -hmm. then we might, uh, you know, turn the screws on you a little bit. But um, <laughs> like, uh, for the most part, uh, you know, like five, six, seven dollars for a lifetime license for a piece of software. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that's pretty reasonable. And a lot of people seem to think so. No, I think I do think it's reasonable as well. Um... And I think for a lot of people, that is going to be something, especially if they're coming from something like, you know, the Adobe suite, where you're spending 10x that. Uh, like, what, I don't even know what the pricing of the Adobe suite is at this point. Some ridiculous price. Um, or like any any sort of like traditional commercial software where it's not even a, in a lot of cases, a lifetime license. It'll be you get a license for this month and then you're going to pay it again next month. And then next month, maybe you get a year. Maybe you'll be lucky and get a year license. But they that license could be revoked at any time if they feel like that you're using the software in a certain way. And I know Adobe is doing some weird stuff where they're, I think they're training on like project files and it it, it getting people are getting banned from Adobe Cloud depending on stuff they have like saved in it and things getting really weird with that company. Like Adobe is a whole a whole big thing, uh, but. With like most other licensing, it's it's very much this short term model as opposed to what you would see back in the early two thousands and the nineties, where it was common to get a lifetime license. Sometimes it would be a lifetime license for a version, like you get software version three, and you get a lifetime to that. Sometimes it would be lifetime for the software, and that's that's nicer, but that that is I would say less sustainable. I think a if a company is selling lifetime for a specific version, I, I don't have an issue with that, right? Like that's that's fine. Yeah. I Yeah, and I mean, we're experimenting with different pricing models mm -hmm. to see what works, to see what's, you know, what people like. And we're open to different types of pricing models. But mm -hmm. at the same time, like the, the few experiments we've been doing for the software that we currently have incubated in-house, um, you know, like a, a sizable number of people on the software that we have that has large or not large, but, you know, semi large bases of users, mm -hmm. um, people pay like a sizable percentage of people pay. Mm -hmm. uh, we might introduce something where it is versioned out uh, in the future where it's like you're paying for this release or that release or whatever. But for now, I mean, most of these projects are in 
kind of like a quasi public beta almost sure. like the the desktop version of our video client is only just now being released for example mm -hmm. so these are very early days for a lot of these projects and we're still trying to work out the kinks <laughs> in the pricing model to find something that can work for everyone right right 